Welcome everyone to the Lee Schools TV podcast. I'm your host, Adam Wright. We have a special one for you today, the top dog himself, Superintendent Dr. Greg Adkins. Sir, I know you're a busy man. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. All right, so we're going to cover a lot of different topics today. Mm -hmm. uh, the half-cent sales tax, of course, being one of them. But before we get to that, uh, I'd like to you know, talk a little bit about your history, your background with the school district of Lee County. You took over as superintendent in September of 2015. Correct? Right, correct. And you had been with the district for a long time before that. Can right. you... Can you give us a little bit of, you know, start from the beginning, your history with sure. the district? Yeah, I started uh, I started with the school district of Lee County back in uh, August 1988, believe it or not. So uh, about 30 years ago as a teacher, science teacher at the late, great Pine Island Middle School, which no longer exists, still an elementary out there. So I taught there for a couple years, uh, and then the school closed, and I moved to uh, Golf Middle and was a teacher there, science teacher, 7th and 8th grade. That's where I went to school. Oh, yeah? yeah. All right. In the late 90s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you, then I just missed you, not by too much. Mm -hmm. I left there uh, about 97, actually, when okay, I left yeah. there, because I was uh, also an assistant principal at that school. Yeah. Moved over, was uh, assistant principal at Paul Lawrence Dunbar Middle School for five years, and principal, I should say, for five years, uh, before moving the district office. I've been down the district office since 2002 in various jobs. Mm -hmm. And you worked in HR before? being named superintendent, correct? Yeah, I worked in human resources for about uh, 10 years, and then I uh, also uh, supervised the East Zone as uh, executive director of operations, and then uh, finally uh, finished up as assistant superintendent operations for the district before becoming superintendent. And you come from a, a long line of educators, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My uh, Believe it or not, my, my great-great-grandfather, his name was Moses Bird, uh, actually uh, taught school in uh, one-room schoolhouses. He would actually ride his horse uh, to teach school. And he was also a farmer, so he, he did both jobs. Uh, my uh, father was a teacher and also an administrator. My mother was a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher. And uh, I've got uh, aunts and uncles that have taught also. So you've been at the superintendent position for about three years now. Uh -huh. What do you think of it? Uh, it is uh, it's an exciting job. It's ever changing every single day. You know, it's got its good days and bad days like anything else. But, you know, one thing that I really enjoy about this job is the fact that when you come to work, it's uh, each day is different from the one before. I was going to. So what is for people who may not know exactly what your responsibilities are as superintendent, how would you describe what your roles, your responsibilities are as the head of the school district? Well, I think uh, one of the things that that I have to do is I have to be that that community face for the rest of the school district. So I'm the person that really works with the community. I work with the school board. Uh, so I'm the person that, that kind of makes that connection. I also work with the school board as a governance team in terms of setting uh, leadership and direction for the district. I uh, work with staff to uh, implement and develop our strategic plan, which gives us our strategic direction. And, um, you know, I think that uh, I'm the person who works with, again, our governance team to set the vision for the district. Among many, many other yeah. things. <laughs> um, what is, I know you said every day is different. What's a typical day like? Or is, is that, that's too broad of a question because they're all so different. Yeah, they are, they are very different. But, uh, you know, it can be a, a, a day where I'm meeting with staff. Uh, it can also be a day where I'm out in the community, you know, meeting with uh, local business leaders and so forth. Um, also uh, meet often with uh, local colleges and universities. And, uh and then uh, it might be a day where I'm out visiting schools for part of the day. So uh, just a lot of different things. Um, you know, you can be troubleshooting a, a major problem, uh, or you can be working on sometimes just rather mundane tasks, like uh, don't want to call the budget mundane, but, you know, that type of thing. So, um, but that's what's neat about it is that you can sit there and move from, you know, one 30 minutes to the next 30 minutes to the next, and each thing is a totally different um, totally different topic of discussion or totally different subject that you're getting to delve into and learn a lot about. What's your favorite aspect, favorite part about being superintendent? Uh, the favorite thing about being superintendent is when you can see what we're able to do for kids. When you see those success stories, I mean, those are the things that are really, they really make your day. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly, um, you know, I was uh, visiting our support our students which is a summer program, a summer at Dunbar Community School. And one of the neatest things was just to have um, interaction with those kids. You know, see those bright eyes and smiles, and, and they're talking about their goals and aspirations, and knowing that what we do here in the school district actually helps 
them reach those goals and objectives. So that's really cool to, to see it really at the ground level with the kids. That's what it's all about, right? That's what it's all about. You Absolutely. mentioned part of your responsibility is formulating that strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Vision 2020, right? That's Vision 2020, right. And you were, you were a big part of writing that vision, that strategic plan, right? Tell us about Vision 2020 for those who might not know what it is. Vision 2020 is really our strategic plan for where we'd like to be in the year 2020, but even beyond that now, we're even looking at Envision 2030. So by, beyond just 2020, but actually now 12 years out in terms of where we want to be as a school district. So what that plan does, it sets academic goals and milestones that we want to reach to, you know, we want to move toward achieving and then uh, work toward developing strategies that help us actually succeed at those goals. Uh, beyond just pure academics, we also are doing things to try to improve our business process efficiency. Uh, we're working on um, improving employee retention and recruitment. Because one of the challenges here in the school district, I mean, the thing that really gets the job done for us are teachers, quality teachers in the classroom, uh, led by a phenomenal principal at the, uh, at the helm. But that takes a lot of work to bring those people, uh, to be able to bring those people to our district and be able to keep them happy and, and so that they're staying here. So that's a major part of our strategic plan as well. And then um, finally, it's uh, developing partnerships with our parents and community. Because what I've learned in this job, probably more than any of the other jobs I've had in the school district, is we cannot do it by ourselves. We have to work with our community and business partners. So those are really the pillars of that strategic plan that uh, we use as our kind of our guide for uh, moving forward in the district. We just started a brand new school year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how do you feel about how things have been going so far? Well, it's exciting because we started out with the opening of Bonita Springs High School, and you know that's just a, a really neat way to begin a school year is with a new school, right? You know, and and to see the the phenomenal programs and uh, see that building come together. That's been a long process and it, it has been painful at times but once you walk those halls it's been well worth it the other thing that's really satisfying is seeing our academic programs really come together this year you know we we got off to start last year a pretty good uh, out of the gates but then we ran right into hurricane irma so we lost our momentum I'm really hoping this year we seem to have really good positive momentum going into this year so uh, to see those academic plans in place, um, I'm really hopeful for uh, outcomes later on. Yeah, let's hope those storms That's stay right. away from us Absolutely. this year. Absolutely. Uh, what are some new uh, initiatives maybe going into effect this year that you're excited about or you know, maybe not so new, but things you're just generally excited about for this school year? Well, one, one thing I just mentioned was, was those academic plans. I mean, that is, uh, that is critically important for our school district because that really provides uh, kind of a guidance for our um, administrators, our teachers, particularly our new teachers, so that they have academic plans to follow in, the, in uh, throughout the year. You know, they know just where they're at. We're also implementing formative assessments like never before this year, which is also kind of exciting. That formative assessments really give our teachers uh, feedback on how well their kids are doing and so that they can make adjustments to the curriculum. So those are a couple big initiatives. I'm also uh, excited to see, um, you know, the expansion of career and tech ed because a lot of our kids uh, do not go on to go to colleges or universities and, and, and which is not a bad thing because there's a lot of opportunity there in just in the business world to come straight out of, out of um, our school and go right into a career or go right into a technical school. So we're really working to expand opportunities in there as well and I'm excited about what I see on the horizon. Awesome. All right. You uh, ready to talk some sales tax? Sure, we can talk sales tax. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so just in case anybody out there isn't aware, this coming November, well, so earlier this year, the school board uh, voted to place a half-cent sales tax referendum on the November ballot, this upcoming November. Right. So on the ballot, voters in Lee County will have the option of voting to raise the sales tax locally here from 6% on the dollar to 6.5%. Mm -hmm. And that would generate approximately $59 million a approximately year. Approximately $59 million a year, yes. And sir. that money would go to the school district to benefit the students. We'll go over what the money would be used for in a minute, but can you explain to us how we got to this point that this would be deemed necessary? Absolutely. Um, the way we got here is that we have seen a reduction in our capital funding over the last decade or, or actually more, particularly since we came 
out of the recession. So if you go back to 2006, 2007, we had capital dollars coming in uh, in excess of $318 million. Those are dollars that, that are brought to the district to pay for new building, maintenance, technology, security, et cetera. Now, just go back uh, just a year ago, 2016, 2017, only $118 million coming in. That's a $200 million difference in just a decade. Okay, now, why is that? Well, you saw a reduction in taxes that come in from, you know, assessing property. You know, a reduction from 2.0 mils down to 1.5 mils. Or really, um, instead of $2 for every $1,000 of assessed value, $1.50. Uh, so we're taking in less there. Reduction of PICO dollars, reduction of impact fees. All that has, has resulted in a dramatic reduction in income. At the same period of time, the number of students coming into this district continues to increase. We're looking at anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 kids coming into our school district every single year, if you can believe that. That's the size of a high school every year. So. We have to continue to build in other, to be able to keep up with that growth. But the dollars to, to accomplish the building that we need to do just simply aren't there anymore. So that's how we got here. So you've got funding going down, enrollment going up. Correct. What kind of, I mean, what kind of problems, issues, impacts has that created? Well, what we're seeing, we're seeing overcrowding, particularly in the east zone and the south zone. So you're seeing schools that have a capacity of like, let's say 1,800 students at like Lehigh Senior High School that now have like 22, 2,300 students. That means they have a building where the cafeteria is not large enough, they don't have enough classroom space, they, they get crowded in the hallways. Um, we have to um, do something to alleviate those types of problems. So deploying more and more portables which costs somewhere in the neighborhood about $67,000 just to deploy one, that's, not, that's only a temporary solution. It's not a long-term solution to, um, to our growth because a portable, at best, is only going to last 10 years. And so um, we, really need to, um, you know, we really need to alleviate growth. Um, the other thing I, that I failed to mention was that we're seeing an increase in class size as we're trying to, to cram more students into a building with less space. And that is also something that we're uh, we're trying to avoid. So, would you say this is this is the key, the the biggest issue facing the school district at this moment? Growth is certainly the biggest the biggest issue facing our school district right now is is handling the rapid growth that we have in our school district. Because not only are we are we wrestling with an addition of four, you know fifteen hundred to two thousand students per year, but actually, if you look at the raw the real numbers there. You're talking about five to seven thousand new students that come in and out of this district every single year. Um, the total number increases, but you're still seeing that tremendous mobility and that tremendous growth, which presents a number of challenges. Having uh, staying up with capacity, just one of them. Mm -hmm. So we've we've had to borrow money. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, now, where do we stand? Well, you mentioned capital funding. Can mm -hmm. you explain to people who may not be aware the difference between, so we have two different budgets, right? Right. Capital and operational. Correct. Can you explain the difference between capital and operational? Sure. Ca our capital budget is used for building infrastructure, such as building new buildings, um, adding on to existing buildings, doing maintenance, adding technology, and also security. Operations, on the other hand, is, is just that, operating the school district, so paying salaries you know, paying insurance, paying uh, for classroom materials, and so forth. So the majority of that goes toward really um, supporting our teachers, support staff, and administrators, whereas the capital, the majority of that goes through actually supporting the infrastructure of the buildings. So if the sales tax referendum were to pass, the money generated would go just to capital? Correct. It would go just to capital. So it would go to new construction, technology, increasing security, and also helping our maintenance of our existing buildings. And we're currently facing, we, we have a pretty large capital funding gap at the moment that we're facing, right? Right. Where right. do we stand? Well, if, if we build everything that we really need to build to keep up with growth in the next five years, we have a gap of, of about $478 million. 
So in other words, between the amount of revenue we have coming in versus what we need to pay for those new buildings and the maintenance of those buildings, a gap of $478 million in just the next five years. That sub sounds substantial. Right. It is substantial. It is substantial. So let's, let's say the half cent sales tax referendum passes in November. Mm-hmm. We would get approximately, based on estimates, $59 million a year. And right. You know, you just kind of went through a short list of what the money would go towards, but can we kind of break that down a little bit more? Can you talk a little bit more about, a little maybe a little bit more specifically, where the money would go? Because I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in hearing about it. Absolutely. That. Well, first and foremost, uh, the school board has made it really clear that we need to make sure that we're spending on safety and security in every one of our buildings. So making sure that all of our buildings have a single point of entry, making sure that we have the uh, buzz-in uh, video surveillance system in, in our, all of our buildings, making sure that our cameras are adequately maintained, those type of things that are done to harden a building. Uh, the second thing that we would be doing is, is focusing on new construction. So again, six new projects in terms of new buildings being built two elementary schools, uh, two middle schools, we have another high school, a couple um, um, renovations or tear down renovation and an addition. So all of that has to be built. And then the maintenance of all of these buildings. So if you think about um, all of our buildings, we have over 799 buildings right now currently. Um, we have um, you know, like more than 90 some schools each one of those schools has specific needs. It might be carpet, it might be a re-roof, it might be a chiller plant. Uh, a lot of our chillers, our HVAC systems are aging right now and uh, those have to be replaced. Replacing one of those can cost you anywhere from three to four point five million dollars. So all of our buildings have certain capital needs, some more than others. The older the building, the more capital needs it has but they all have something, whether it's safety and security upgrades or major infrastructure improvements. So new construction and the maintenance of existing. And then I failed to mention um, technology. You know, technology is a big piece of this. And one of the things that's really, really important, we're trying to prepare our kids for the workforce of not just today, but also tomorrow. And in order to do that, our kids have to have up-to-date equipment, up-to-date technology. You, we would do them a disservice if we if we train them on antiquated technology and then they turn around they go try to apply for a job and they don't have the skills necessary because they have we haven't kept up so all of that is what we'd be using this for how could, how would you explain the both the short term and the long term benefits of having this capital funding available well the, the short term benefits First and foremost is our kids would be in, in really high quality facilities across the entire school district. You don't want to get yourself in a situation like some other states and some other districts have got themselves in where you have haves and have nots. Some, some students going to schools that are really subpar while others are going to, to schools that are really, um, you know, um, extremely desirable. So that's, that's, a, that's what I see as a, both a short term and a long term benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, the technology that I mentioned, I mean, that is something that can have, again, a short-term benefit really right off the, out of the gates because kids would have an opportunity to start working right with that new technology, right with that new equipment. Um, so I think that, uh, and then, of course, the safety and security is something that as soon as something's implemented, we're making our schools safe. And, you know, that is, goes without saying that that's an immediate um, improvement. Now, there would not only be benefits to the school district, but could potentially be benefits to the Lee County community as a whole, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I hear I hear almost every day from our um, our business partners, you know, our community leaders, the need for trained workers and how we still have a gap between what comes out of our educational system and what goes into the workforce. So, if I'm an employer. Knowing that kids in the school district of Lee County are, are going to class and uh, where you have state-of-the-art equipment with state-of-the-art instruction, that they're getting the skills that they need to be successful, that's, I'm going to get excited about that because that means you know, I, have to, I don't have to go searching everywhere for the worker that I need. I can get it right from a school district of Lee County student who's graduating. So 
um, you know, it's it's been demonstrated in research study after research study that that a quality education is the number one economic dri uh, driver for a community, and I think that we, you know, we sometimes we lose sight of that. But if we invest in a high quality education, we improve the economy locally, we reduce crime, we reduce poverty. Uh, it's just got it just really improves the quality of life in Lee County. Having high quality schools in neighborhoods increases property values. I know studies show that, right? Absolutely. It sure does. Uh, you know, I, I was recently looking at a, a study from California and you had significant uh, increase in property values in those school districts that implement it, uh, have a bond issue is what they call it in California. And they compared it to school districts that did not see this. And, and uh, school districts that, that failed to pass their referendums did not reap the benefits, whereas the, the school districts that did uh, you saw increased property values and Im improvement in the quality of life. So, yeah, and that's just one of, of many studies. And we wouldn't be the first school district in Florida to, to pass a referendum like this. That's what's most ironic here in, in my mind is that if you look at across the school districts of, of Florida, you know, most of them have some type of surtax that supports education. So most communities in the state of Florida have invested in, in education. And here's the other thing that I think is really striking, is if you look at the six school districts in our state that are growing as rapidly as we are, we are the only one that does not have a surtax to help, uh, help support our growth. The only one. You know, so I really feel that in a way our kids are getting shortchanged here because they don't have the support that other students have, not only in this state, but also across the nation. So some people might be wondering, why, why a sales tax? Why are there not other means of generating revenue for the school district without taxing or raising taxes? I mean, we live in a conservative area. Right. Um, you know, they don't, people don't like having their taxes raised. Sure. So why, why not raising impact fees or, or property taxes or using the Florida lottery money to help generate revenue? I mean, these are some questions that some people might be wondering. Well, let, let's look at those, you know, quickly. First of all, lottery is probably the, it is extremely regressive tax that is, is really misunderstood. Lottery is something that's very expensive to administer. And a lot of what the lottery takes in, a lot of, a lot of has to pay out in administrative fees and also in prizes. So the amount of dollars that we get for the lottery just runs our school district like a day and a half. That's it, you know, a day and a half. Now, the other impact fees. Impact fees, a very small number of dollars here. It's, uh, you know, it's basically on new construction only, so you're not raising a lot. Um, if we raise it to 100%, it may raise us an additional maybe $9 million at the most. Uh, and then finally, property taxes. We used to be at 2.0 mills. If we went back to that, we would probably raise an additional $39 million, and, but that burden would be borne purely by our property owners. So, you know, we get a lot of tourism in this, in this community. And, you know, these tour, tourists come down and we don't, you know, that's, it's great that they come down here. They spend their dollars in our stores. They visit our beaches. Uh, they, they add to our community. But they also add things that, that cost our school district, such as all that traffic on the road, which increases our bus ride times. You know, it takes longer for us to, to get a bus to and from school, which means we're, we're spending more in fuel. We're spending more on the driver, you know, paying more overtime costs. Mm -hmm. So that's a cost to the district. If if you do a referendum that's a half penny sales tax, that's a that's a tax that's passed on not just to your property owners, but it's also passed on to everyone else who spends money in in Lee County. And it's a small amount. If you think about the average family, um, fifty thousand dollars a year family of four, it would be sixty four dollars. I mean, that's what you're talking per about. Year per year. Big purchase. It, it gets capped at the first $5,000. So if you go out and buy that big pickup truck for a huge price tag, it's still only going to cost $25 in additional tax. Doesn't tax fuel, doesn't tax medicine, doesn't tax food. So I think, you know, this is something that's pretty reasonable, uh, but yet for the school district brings in $59 million. So way more than lottery, way more than impact fees, way more than property tax, still didn't close the gap, 
in terms of the dollars that we need, but it, it's the one that goes the furthest. What about some kind of bond? Is that, would that have been an option? Well, the bonds, we do, we do borrow money through what's called COPS, which are Certificates of Participation, which is a bond. The problem with a bond is while it's a, a really good financial vehicle, there's a low interest rate there, it's still a debt. And so what happens is you've got a debt that's stretched out for maybe 30 years. Our kids that we're educating today would actually be the ones paying that debt off in the future. And I think it would be more responsible for us if we were just to, to, to move down um, or go down an, an avenue that pays for this right now, invest in Lee County, invest in these schools rather than instead passing, of literally passing the bus. Instead okay. of literally passing, you might have the just stolen on. your line. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. But that's yeah. absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. It's it's passing the buck on to the very kids that we're educating, and and I think there's a better way. So how do you, how would you respond to critics? Um, and you know we know they're out there that who say or who criticize the district for not being fiscally responsible saying well you know we got ourselves into this situation to begin with how, how do you respond to them well first of all i would say if you really look at the benita springs high school situation with one of the ones that gets brought up in terms of uh, being criticized that at the end of the day that was just a bad estimate and it, it's not even real it's not even a cost overrun it was a bad estimate which resulted in us improving our process so the, the final product of Benita Springs High School, just as an example, is, is one that we're delivering a building that from a, uh, a cost per student station perspective is right in the middle of the state. So it's very, very typical. And it's actually superior to what you're going to see in, like, let's say, Charlotte County. We're somewhere between six and $12,000 below what you might see at Lima Bay High School in terms of its cost per student station. Now, if you look at uh, our financial track record, you can look no further than our audits. You know, we have clean audits. Our financial audits for the last 10 years have been very clean. Our operations audits have had, um, you know, if we have findings on operation audits, it's something that we don't have substantive findings. So we've even done an efficiency audit to even improve beyond that. We're, we're highly audited, highly accountable. And to be transparent, we take our audit results and literally post them on our website so citizens can view them for themselves. So it's not just my word, it's actually out there on the web for you to see. And leeschools.net, and they can find it there? That's right, mm -hmm. they can find it there. And so we've gone over how we got here. Mm -hmm. um, a significant decrease in, in funding from the state over the past several years. Correct, yeah. We've gone over the benefits that this extra money would give us. We've gone over why a sales tax may be a better option than some other options of generating revenue. Mm -hmm. So, but ultimately this comes down to the voters in November. We're giving them the chance to vote on this and let them decide if they want to make this happen or not. So let's say it doesn't happen. What would that mean if this doesn't pass? What would that mean for the district? Well, I think uh, if it if it doesn't pass, what it would mean for the district are, are several different things. First of all, um, we would have to borrow more money because you still have students that are coming to our district, so you would you would see us borrowing dollars so that we could build the schools that we really need to build, just so we can have the capacity for the kids that are coming. The second thing, though, we're going to have to make some real tough choices as it relates to uh, maintenance, as an example, because. If you look at the dollars that you borrow, it comes out of the same pot of money as your maintenance budget comes from. So the more money we have to use to spend paying back the debt, the less money we would have for paying, um, you know, paying for school maintenance. So um, what that means is that we have to make some tough choices. So we may have to replace that roof, replace that HVAC system, but other things might have to be put off or deferred. Um, we wouldn't be able to invest in technology to the degree that we currently do today. So our kids necessarily wouldn't have the, the best in technology, and we couldn't keep up with the pace that we need to keep up with. Uh, you would have us, we'd have to make some tough choices when it comes to how we harden and secure our buildings. And then finally, um, you know, you're really looking at a, a situation where you're going to have to deploy more portables. Um, not a good option, 
and um, you know something that in the case of a hurricane you know that's where we see a lot of damage uh, it's also not the most secure facility but something that we would have to do because it's a cheaper short-term solution um, but you know I think there's a there's a better solution out there and again if it, if it were to pass it wouldn't last forever right it would not last forever we purposely put a uh, sunset of 10 years because that allows the taxpayers of Lee County to evaluate the effectiveness of this and whether or not we are continuing to grow at the rate if we're not if we're no longer growing at that rate then there would not be that need to continue something like that so if it were if estimates were are correct and it generated about 59 million dollars a year over 10 years it's 590 million dollars if my math is correct right, right so that would give us enough to cover that estimated budget shortfall that mm -hmm. we would be facing um, can you well I s you, you mentioned that if it if it were not to pass that we would have to borrow more money mm -hmm. can you put into more perspective what that would mean if we had to continue to keep borrowing more money well just to give you an example um, right now we, we are paying about 50 million dollars in debt out of that cap so if you have hundred and twenty million dollars in your capital budget per se which is approximately what what ours is right now already you're taking 50 million of that and you're putting toward debt the rest of it you can put toward maintenance and new construction now if you borrow more money then you're gonna have to pay more of those dollars in debt so right now we have uh, close to 500 million dollars in debt if if we take that $478 million delta and borrow all that, that's almost another $500 million in debt, which means another $50 million in debt service. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, so that, those dollars would eat away at the dollars that we would have to maintain your, your building. So you'd be, you'd be taking your maintenance budget and potentially eventually cutting it in half or your technology budget and cutting it in half. And all that money is just going into a bank going to a bank probably out of Lee County somewhere and uh, I would say that you know a better investment would be to invest here in Lee County okay I see you're wearing your I voted sticker right so and I, I think I've heard you say before that you know we, we we can't tell people how to vote right um, but your one of your big messages to the the people out there in Lee County is just to to educate themselves and right. to vote just That's to get right. out and vote that's right. Yeah, just get out and vote. Be a responsible voter, you know, someone who does their homework and uh, finds out the information they need, whether it's on this issue. Uh, and I encourage people, you know, find out uh, pros and cons on any issue that you're going to vote on and also on candidates. You know, I think it's uh, just responsible. So we want to we want to as an employer um, and as somebody who educate students to, to really be a good example in terms of what it would be to be a, a I think a good citizen and to exercise your civic duty and to get out there and vote November 6th November right? 6th if yes. you haven't voted already voting I know early voting has already happened right and oh another thing that I failed to bring up was um, people might be interested in uh, the you know we want to be transparent with people and monitoring you know if it were to pass how the money would be spent we would be setting up a an oversight committee right where do we stand with that and what what would that involve who would be on it if you can tell me where we are yeah, we do have a, a citizens oversight community uh, committee that would be comprised of citizens of our community that would literally be um, selected you know by our school board and uh, those people would be reporting really to the citizens of Lee County at least annually on how these dollars are being spent and then they would be making recommendations as to whether or not we would continue even even if we got let's say five years into this and growth you know really leveled off and we didn't need the dollars anymore this committee would be recommending to our school board that we would go you know that we would no longer levy this type of attack so this is a group of outside people that are are accountable to no one other than the citizens of Lee County that will be watching and reporting on how this budget is being spent and making sure that if you look at the project list we we had to put out there this is what the dollars would be spent for the on these things so it can't be spent for anything else we can't spend it on salaries we can't spend it on pet projects we have to spend it on 
what's just on that project list so that committee would be reporting to the citizens of Lee County that we're doing just that. And the, this, this committee hasn't been selected yet. That right. would come after the election. Right. And it would be volunteers, correct? Right. Uh, wide swath of people of different backgrounds and professions, but obviously people that have some expertise in, in finance and construction and all kinds of different things. That right? would be correct, yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? sales no, tax related. I think you, I think okay. you covered it. <laughs> well, if you have any, uh, if you listening or watching out there have any, if you want to know more about the half cent sales tax, you can go to leeschools.net slash change for change. For more information, we have a bunch of uh, information on our website related to the half cent sales tax leading up to November, frequently asked questions, uh, charts and graphs and budget information and information on where the, the money would be spent. So again, leeschools.net slash change for change. Okay, um, so enough of that. <laughs> um, I'm sure you're interested in talking about other things for a little bit. And I was doing a little bit of research on you beforehand and I uh, was delighted to see that you have com uh, competed in I know I know I knew you were a runner but I wasn't I wasn't aware that you have competed in several Ironman triathlons in the past correct is this right. something that you still do or is there, there are these well, this I, years ago yeah this was uh, <laughs> uh, a few years ago okay. I used to used to do uh, triathlons uh, I don't have as much time to train anymore as you can <laughs> yeah. imagine. But yeah, I, I, I competed in uh, three uh, Ironman, Ironman um, triathlons, which is uh, um, it's an awesome event to participate so in. running, cycling, yeah, and swimming. You start out with a 2.4-mile swim, and then you go right into 112 miles on the bike, and then you finish it off with a marathon or a 26.2-mile run. So and you've done how many of those? Three, three okay. of them. Three. And... Um, yeah, three of them, and within actually a short period of time, I was able to complete them all within one, one year. You did three um, in one year. Okay. Yeah, three in one year. But then beyond that, I've done a lot of other, you know, similar distance or smaller ones, uh, the half Ironman, which are half that distance, uh, some Olympics, some, some a lot of runs and a lot of sprints. How much, how much training beforehand goes into? competing in an event like that? Well, any, anybody who wants to do an Ironman, my, my recommendation is, first of all, get a coach who knows what they're doing training. I had a great coach who, who was actually able to get me across the finish line uninjured three times. So uh, that's the first thing, because there is a lot of training and you need somebody who really knows what they're doing. Um, the training would build up for me probably um, in the neighborhood of almost probably 15, 16 hours a week as it tops out. Um, how long before a, a year? Or? Yeah, I would say I really would recommend to anybody give it two years before you do a full Ironman. I've seen some real, uh, really astounding athletes, tremendous athletes that only do a year and then try to do it and then bonk like on the run, you know, and rather than do that, because you have to have enough time for your capillaries, your ligaments, all your body really to build up to that type of event because you may be out there. Uh, anywhere from 12 to 17 hours. You know, they give you 17 hours to finish. It starts at 7 in the morning, goes to midnight. And you have to cross the finish line in that period of time. But it takes, um, you know, you've got to think about, um, like on the bike, you should do, typically we would do at least 400-mile uh, bike rides leading up to that event. And, and leading up to that, you know, you start out with 30. Then you're building to 40, 50, 60, 70. And then you get to 100, and you're going to do that at least four times before you're, you're going to do the event. Same with a run. You know, you're building up to usually around 20 miles, you know, and that may take you, you know, three, four hours to complete on a training run. So you think about a weekend, you're spending a lot of time on the bike, a lot of time, um, you know, running. And then during the week, uh, time in the gym, lifting weights, uh, time in the pool, swimming, you know, and everything that goes into it. It's it's uh, pretty intense. Yeah, I mean, how grueling is, I mean, can you take us to your, your the first one that you competed in? Did you get, you know, a little bit into it and just say, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? How, how intense was it? Can you describe it? Yeah, it was, my, the first one I ever did was uh, was actually in, uh, in Cozumel, which was, that was a really cool one to do because the swim was just absolutely beautiful. And then at the tail end of the swim, you know, so about two miles into it, we actually got to swim around a submarine. So that was that was kind of neat. 
But the bike ride where it really kind of dawned on me is on the back side of the island. Uh, we did three loops around the island. Mm -hmm. And on the backside of the island, you run into this super intense wind. So you might be typically running at, at 18, 19, 20 miles per hour on a bike, and it knocks you down to, to you know, I remember being knocked down to maybe 10 miles per hour, and I'm passing people, but it was, it, which surprised me, but that has how intense that wind is. And, and when you realize, man, I still got 60 miles to go, and I'm already dead tired, you know, it really dawns on you that, or when you finish, that was the other thing. I finished, I was so happy about finishing the bike portion and you get on the run and then you realize, oh, I got 26 miles to go. <laughs> but you know, it, the, the other side of it though is that those, those events usually have a lot of people. And so you had just these crowds that are always cheering you on. And then when you cross the finish line, they, they will announce your name individually and say, you are an Iron Man. That's a pretty, pretty cool event. And the last thing that's neat about it, and I would suggest, is always train with a group of people. I had a great triathlon team geared up. They were fantastic. Helps and for motivation. It helps to motivate. Your teammates help, you know, help uh, cheer you on. Uh, and when you're having a tough day, they're there to lift you up. And, and uh, again, it, it starts with a good coach, too. And I had a good one, Angie Ferguson. How did, how did it feel when you when you – finally cross that finish line it's an amazing feeling yeah. it's an amazing feeling and and something i would suggest anybody do is if you go to um an iron man during the last hour like from 11 o'clock to midnight and you watch those people that have been out there on the course for 16 plus hours and see their faces when they cross the finish line i mean that is that's extremely uplifting and, and you're talking about people from all walks of life who have trained, 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 and then uh, it culminates in that event, and they've been out there all day. It's just really neat to see the crowd is cheering them, the music's playing, and, and they cross the finish line and they announce their name. It's just neat to see their face. Do, do you just sleep for like four and a half weeks after you're done with <laughs> it? Sure work? feels that way, yeah. Um, yeah, they, really you go into almost a month of recovery where you're, you're really, you know, first couple of days you're doing very, very little, because you're super sore, um, but then beyond that, you know, you're just kind of easing your way back into training. Um, you know, so it uh, it takes a while to, to for your body to rebuild from that type of experience. And these can be dangerous too, right? You were telling me earlier that you had a a mishap while you were swimming during one of them. Yeah, you know, there's uh, you, you you're looking at like 2,500 people in the water at the same time. A cannon goes off, and you're all swimming in in. Uh, in the same direction and there's it's very very chaotic so a lot of bodies in the water um, this one is in Arizona and I'm about a mile out in the swim and uh, a, a big guy comes right across in front of me and on his backstroke his elbow came right here right across my nose and um, of course you know I got I got you know blood coming out of my nose at that point but fortunately the water was cool and it stopped the bleeding and I was able to go on and and no swelling because of all that that coldness but yeah I mean I've seen uh, I've seen a lot of uh, you know a lot of people get not huge hurtful injuries but a lot of people that aren't able to complete because of some type of injury or um, the one I did in Utah had a lot of people on the swim because of hypothermia you know, it, the water was just so so cold. It was like 59 degrees, and um, and so we had we lost. Um, I heard it was something like 200 people out of the 2,500 that started just on the swim. So, not it, you didn't lose. No, lose no, no. They no, no, dropped out of the race because <laughs> of hypothermia. They watch it. You know, that's the the good thing about those events is they're really well um, observed. You have police officers. You have emergency personnel that are there so if somebody does get in trouble they're right there to help them when was the how long ago was the last one you did uh last one probably um about nine ten years ago something like that you miss it at all uh i miss my teammates mm -hmm. a lot okay. i miss my teammates they they're uh they like i said they were we had made some good friendships and i still stay in touch with a number of them but you don't see them every day like i used to which is neat all right now i know another passion of yours is farming Right. We talk about that a little bit. Now, you mentioned earlier, was it your great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather? Great-great-grandfather. Moses. He, you said he was yep. a farmer. Yep, he was a farmer. So, and you you have a small farm, right, at your home? Right, that yep. you Tell us, do you grow vegetables? Do you have animals? What 
What do you, what do you uh, have there? Little, little of all that. Yeah, we have, um, yeah, Teresa and I have a small farm in Buckingham here in Lee County, and uh, we have uh, we have cows. Uh, we ha- And then we're actually expecting, hopefully this week, to have a couple calves, you know, because they're, oh. they're really at the end of, uh, at, of their pregnancies. We have uh, goats. Uh, we do grow um, hogs you know, that we usually grow for a portion of the year, and then we process those. Um, we have uh, poultry, so chickens, both for eggs and also for meat. Uh, we have turkeys, ducks, um, and we are considering experimenting with sheep. We haven't done that right. yet. So, and then in addition to that, we have we do grow a garden. Usually, we have one in the fall, one in the spring. So we're about ready to start our fall garden. And then finally, we have um, we do have some fruit trees. Yeah. What kind of fruits and vegetables? Uh, vegetables we would have would grow anything from romaine lettuce, peppers, tomatoes. Uh, we'll have string beans. We'll have collards. Um, you know, hot peppers. We do. Teresa has a spice garden. And then in terms of fruits, uh, we have uh, oranges, limes. Uh, that we're just starting with the limes, and then. Uh, um, that's about it. Uh, avocados. We have an avocado tree. So. Do you find do you find it tastes better when you've grown it yourself? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the pork is amazing. Yeah. The pork is really amazing, and then the the chickens and the turkeys are as well. There's something because we do we try to grow things naturally. So like chickens, for example, are free range. So we don't we don't have uh, mm-hmm. we don't do like containment farming or anything like that. And that's the other neat thing about it is that you know these animals live a great life and. Um, you know, as opposed to what you might see with some of the factory farms. And is this something that you work on a little bit every day on the weekends and something to take, you know, your mind off of maybe some of the more stressful parts of your job? Yeah. I mean, it's something you see, particularly you see Teresa do it on the week. She does it throughout the week. Um, I get to do it on the weekends and, and it does. It's nice to be able to work on a project uh, and, you know, whether it's building something or, or working on something like a garden and see it, see it grow, uh, gives you some really sometimes instant satisfaction or, or, uh, you see it over the course of time, but, um, it's, yeah, it's just, it's just neat and it definitely takes you to a real positive place. So those are two of your passions, but obviously your main passion is education. Right. So before we go, just any final thoughts on just, you know, what drew you? I mean, obviously, like you said, you come from a family of educators, but I mean, just what, what is it about education that, that you love? Well, education is just a really positive profession because you can change somebody's life through a high quality education. It's about building relationships with kids and seeing those kids, uh, their hopes and dreams actually come to fruition and you have a part of helping them along their journey. Uh, you know, this is not about the pursuit of, you know, fame or money or some other. This is about helping other people, and that's what I, that's what I like to do. I, at the end of the day, I'm a people person. I like working with people. I like helping people, and education as a profession allows me to do that every single day. Is there anything else you want to talk about before right, we wrap it up? That's it. All right. Well, Superintendent Dr. Greg Atkins, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope, ha- hope to have you on again sometime. And yeah, thank you all for watching and listening. We'll see you next time.